When I was a sophomore in high school in 1959, I bought an old Fairbanks and Cole banjo at an antique store in my hometown of Marblehead, Massachusetts, and I restored, restored it. I took it all apart and cleaned up all the metal parts and refinished it in, in spar varnish because I was around a lot of boats and put it back together again and and it just it seemed like a perfectly normal thing to do. Because I grew up in a town where people worked with their hands. You know, it was a boat building town and I had boats and I was around boat yards and so people made stuff. Just normal. And my Dad had a workshop in the basement. I had a workshop in the basement. My mother's mother had given me a little Stella guitar when I was about 12. So I was into it a little bit. And then big folk revival started happening in the late 50s. And I got the banjo, and then I, I got a Harmony Stella 12-string guitar. And then while I was still in high school, I started modifying it. I, I inlaid... Piano ivory, and I basically made binding out of it, and and did the fingerboard, and I did a a um, very thin sheet copper pick guard for it, and I refinished it. So my first explorations in luthery were just plunging in, and then when I went away to college, Boston, Boston University, basically spent most of my time with folkies in coffee houses instead of in class. And I eventually fell into the String Instrument Workshop, which was in Boston, and it was a repair facility. I'd started making woven leather, wide braided leather guitar straps. And these guys at, at the uh, String Instrument Workshop thought, well, those are really cool. Come work for us and we'll sell them. And in about a week and a half, I stocked them up with you know, a year's worth of guitar straps or something like that. And they started tossing repair work to me. And this was pretty old school. It was uh, all hot hide glue, no specialized tools. It was really pretty crude in many ways. There were two books that I knew of on guitar making. One was by... A.P. Sharp, and it was published by Clifford Essex in England. The other was by a guy named H.E. Brown. It was his little paperback. And both of these books were primarily about classical guitar building, with a kind of a cursory nod to steel string at the end. There was no Stu Mac in those days. Uh, the closest thing that we had was a place in New York called H.L. Wild. And then out on the West Coast, there was uh, Vitaly Imports. I was also playing guitar a lot. And so in 1965, I got tapped to go on the road with Canadian folk singer Zihan Silvia. And it was just a phenomenal gig. Uh, it was traveling and playing Newport Folk Festival and the Hollywood Bowl and, and you know, Symphony Hall in Boston and uh, lots of great clubs. It was just a great gig. Got my first experience in recording studios, doing an album with them. I moved back to Cambridge and then pretty quickly moved down to New York and jumped into a rock and roll band and started getting into working on electric guitars, doing wiring and eventually building my own instrument with a, a neck from a, a Gibson 61 or 62 Les Paul, which is now known as the SG shape. And I uh, made a body for it, rough shape, uh, a body, and I put it together on my kitchen table and went over to the dark side of, of electricity. I moved out to the West Coast, did some session work with uh, Jerry Corbett, who'd been in the Young Bloods, played on um, Don McLean's first album called Tapestry before the Carol King Tapestry album. Started also building electric basses. Jesse Colin Young got the first bass that I made. Then in 1969, I was introduced to the Grateful Dead and the whole technical team that was starting up around them, pulled together mainly by uh, uh, Augustus Owsley Stanley, 
who had this vision of bringing musicians, technicians, engineers, and artisans together to make a new generation of gear, all the gear. We formed a company in 1970, Alembic, with electronics engineer Ron Wickersham, recording engineer Bob Matthews, and myself. And we were the really the technical arm of the, the whole San Francisco scene. Grateful Dead, uh, we were working with them. Jefferson Airplane, Hot Tuna, a little bit with Quicksilver, some with Santana, and so on. Uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. And then by 1970, well, we coalesced into a, a California corporation to do, mainly to be able to do this tour, uh, a movie tour for Warner Brothers. And then when that was done, we had this place in San Francisco where I started building instruments and modifying them and really doing much more of the electrical stuff. I'd also, in, by 69, I was starting to make uh, magnetic pickups for electric bass and guitar. And it turned out that they had extremely wide band frequency response. And so we matched those with uh, onboard electronics to really kind of do this modern electric thing. And so for many years, my main focus was in electric instruments, but I always maintain an instrument in the acoustic instruments. I tended to play more acoustic and build more electric. My retirement projects, mostly stuff that all needs fixing up, you know, but this, this is one of the most interesting ones. This is a 1933 Lloyd Lohr Vivitone acoustic electric Spanish Hawaiian, putting Lohr clearly in the, among the pioneers of, of electric guitar. In 1933, he came out with, with these, the, the Vivitone guitar with the recessed carved back, he did a solid-bodied version of it, and then a um, mandolin, violin, viola, bass, and he also um, came out with an electric, a couple of models of electric keyboard, electric claviers. This is kind of funny. Jackson Brown gave this to me. as it, it, There's a joke contained within it, and that is if you look at the peg head, it's got the Gibson Dovewing peg head top, a few years back, uh, Gibson was sending out the uh, cease and desist letter on anyone using the dove wing peg head. And so Jackson thought it was hilarious and gave this to me as a, yeah, let's see, let's see them send a letter to Calcutta. This was top of the line, an all heart abalone fingerboard. You put white mother pearl dots in it. I guess it's, <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> But what's neat about these also is the craftsmanship is just exquisite. It's, it's fully equal to what Martin was doing in Nazareth, Pennsylvania at that time. And you can't say that about very many other American instruments of, of this period. Uh, most of the washburns were not this nicely made. The very top of the line were nice, but this is, is quite unusual. So this is where my inspiration for the tilting neck came from. This is a, a circa 1897 How Warm guitar. And on this, uh, this is sort of a fixed hinge point here. And then the the neck tilt is adjusted with, with these two bolts here. And once again, you have the cantilevered fingerboard that does not really touch the top. It's got not a lot of clearance, but it's got a bit. I first started seeing these guitars as a guitar repair apprentice in 1963. And yeah, it also has this unusual arched, pressed arched top. They, in the patent, it's called a longitudinal belly ridge. What it does, of course, is make the, it, it really stiffens up the top to resist torque uh, without adding very much weight. And so these things are just they're quite amazing. So yeah, so these were, when I started seeing these in 
not in great profusion, but a few of them in the, in the early and mid 60s. I got it that uh, you do not need a dovetail neck joint to make a great sounding guitar. I was just thinking about how they did a neck reset in those days. It was just utterly brutal. It was like, okay, take the fingerboard extension off at the neck joint, just remove that, saw through the slot, get rid of it, and then fill the dovetail with water, stick a butter knife in it, put a torch on it. Of course, with that, you were lucky if the water boiled and softened the glue before the wood swole up, making it impossible to get the neck off. But it was pretty brutal stuff. The first of the tilt neck guitars was one that I made for Henry Kaiser to take to Antarctica. I, he, he played a guitar that I made that didn't have the tilting neck. Really liked it and called me up and said, Rick, what's the only continent on which a record album has never been made? And I'm going, oh, my God. He said, Antarctica, and I figured out how to get there. The National Science Foundation does a series of artists and residence grants every year. And Henry knew somebody on the committee, and they said, it's never been done. All you have to do is give us a halfway decent proposal, and, and you got it. As part of the proposal, I wrote my proposal for the guitar, detailed the woods that I was going to use and that it was going to have the tilting neck and all that. Henry commissioned the guitar before he got the grant. He had the faith in, in my doing this. And it was, it had the very stiff carbon fiber reinforced neck with the carbon fiber extending out. It had a considerably greater gap than in the guitar in the other room because it was an experiment. But he, he took it to Antarctica in 2001, 2002, and it's never needed a neck. It needs nothing. It, I've never had to adjust it. I just stayed, you know, and, it, and down there he was in conditions that were minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit and the guitar would be down in low single digit humidity uh, because of the way it is down there. And it came back with a few dings in it, but other than that, it came back just fine. So I figure if it, if you could take that, then I'm, I'm on the right track. When you really look at the requirements of a neck, what you really would like to have is this this run from ear to ear to be totally predictable. As someone who's repaired a whole lot of old guitars, this issue that always seems to happen here at the neck joint of either you've got a hump or you've got a dip, it's just it's unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. When you when you design a guitar, and some of this came from my friend Kenny Hill. Rather than design a shape, everybody wants to design a shape, and it's really, you know, that's fine, that's cool. But really what you want to do is design it from the side. You draw a straight line, and that's a string. And then what's the next thing below the string? It's the fret tops. And you want that to be totally controllable from end to end. You want a, you want a little relief in there, but you don't want this popping up or dropping down. You don't want any bumps in there. The geometry of the instrument changes. And it, it's, it's not that the top bellies up, although it does. It's not just that the neck warps, although it does. But the entire geometry of the guitar changes. The, the backs are usually domed to a certain degree, uh, arched. And what will happen is that with this 160 pounds or so of string tension, pulling on that, the backs tend to flatten out a bit, and then these these end blocks tend to move like that, you know, like this, and up goes the neck. And it may hit some sort of static elastic limit to the motion, to the movement in the in the wood, 
by putting that, that carbon fiber on top of the center seam reinforcement uh, and by putting in the carbon fiber on top of the, the back braces inside, I'm kind of helping hold this dome uh, in place. And then with the, with the carbon fiber uh, flying buttresses, I'm trying to support this portion of the guitar and take that the tension down into um, a very stiff area of the guitar, really along along this line. Here you can see kind of our our approach, which is carbon fiber topped back braces, carbon fiber topped continuously uh, running uh, back strip reinforcement, and the uh, carbon fiber flying buttresses. Um, this these take the neck pressure here and transfer them down into the sides and basically removes the responsibility of supporting the top and supporting the neck pressure from the upper bow so we can go very very light with the uh, bracing of the upper bow giving the fret tops the most solid foundation is really important and by inlaying carbon fiber rods up into the underside of the fingerboard, that fingerboard is not going anywhere. When I do one of these fingerboards and, and I glue the half inch tall by eighth inch wide carbon fiber up into the fingerboard, I can put that fingerboard on the floor on blocks and stand in the center. We drop carbon fiber into the neck and then also up into the fingerboard. And that lets us put um, a half inch of carbon fiber in the neck rather than the usual three eighths. So the necks are very, very stiff. And then we'll, um, we'll relieve away the carbon fiber in, in this area and it, would, it will then essentially float off of the top so that the, the fingerboard is not touching the top. So by doing this thing of running the carbon fiber all the way down, you're maintaining the playability of this of this fingerboard all the way it turns the whole structure of the neck upside down where the fingerboard itself becomes the structural member of the neck the fingerboard is stiffer than the neck we do the same thing with the ukuleles even though i don't have carbon fiber up in this part of the neck i've got a flatter piece of carbon fiber running from about the seventh fret to the end of the fingerboard. And it's amazing how stiff that makes it. I can be playing these notes, and the fingerboard is not dying away, and it's not killing the sustain or the, or the presence of those notes. So that's this engineering approach, which is that the, the string is the important thing. And then what you want to do is support the use of the string by, you, you work your way down, frets, fingerboard, carbon fiber, neck. And in that sense, the neck is almost the least significant part of it. Whereas most people think just the opposite. They start with the neck and they work up to the string. I'm starting at the string and working down at the back of the neck. And then, if the guitar moves, you can just adjust the neck a little bit. It's a 15-inch uh, cutaway, and you can see that there is a gap, and the neck angle is adjustable. There are two bolts here and here that are the pivot points. There's a plate of brass inlaid in, uh, in here, and then we've got... Uh, through here. With this, we can actually move the entire neck in and out and change the overall intonation if need be. And then we've also got yaw, so we can we can adjust where the strings lay on the neck just by adjusting the sideways tilt of the neck. And then we can adjust the action. So here's the truss rod itself. So we've taken a Mark Blanchard style um, differential thread truss rod, which is 1024 at this end and 1032 at this end. 
The advantage of this rod is that it acts as though it's geared down. He gives it about a six to one mechanical uh, advantage, which means more turns, but a lot less torque required, and then much finer degree of, of adjustability. And then we've welded this uh, three eighths steel rod to it so that when we're done with this, the neck tilt adjust bears up against this rod in the heel. And then this goes into what's essentially a T-nut in, uh, in the neck block. And so in and out, you got your, your tilting adjust like that. There's also, uh, this hole is also threaded and it becomes the, the lock uh, screw. So you, you release that one, you back that one off, you adjust this to adjust the tilt, and then you tighten that up to lock it in place. So, so there's this trade-off, this, this affordability, convenience, engineering trade-off. This whole thing of teasing apart structure and tone and, um, and applying engineering and modern materials particularly to the structural side of things. I try to take that, tear it all apart and build it back up with most of the things I do with guitars, you know? I see on some of the forums, people are doing beautiful guitar, great inlay work. Why can't they get it to play without buzzing? because they haven't done enough fret jobs. You better be, I don't think you get halfway good at a fret mill until you've done at least a hundred of them. And you don't, you don't do a hundred fret mills if you're building 10 or 12 guitars a year. <laughs> you know, you just, you don't get there from here. And the other thing is that you don't have that interaction with real world musicians, real world customers on a wide variety of instruments. Bonnie Wright bringing in a guitar and saying, when I look down, I can see my, my shoes. Well, that meant that the action was too high. And, and how do you learn these things? By, by being there when these people come in. And also being tolerant of different playing styles, different string gauges. Knowing that when a guitar comes in and it's in a weird tuning, you document that tuning. And maybe you document the string gauges. Ry Cooter brought me a guitar once that was in some weird tuning. And the what would normally be the high E and the B were tuned to the same note. Like they were both tuned to maybe B or C. And they were two different gauges. Uh, you know, one was like a 10, one was an 11 or something like that, or a, a 12 and a 13. And you can't immediately decide that it's wrong. Because when you think about it, if you have two strings that are tuned to the same pitch and they're different gauges, each one of those is going to develop a slightly different set of harmonics. And maybe that those different harmonics beating against each other are exactly what was required for this particular tuning, for this guitar, for this song. And so you don't you document all that stuff. You learn that musicians are quirky and that very often they are correct in their oddities. And, and it's okay to ask, but you don't just forget what the tuning was and then throw any set of strings on it and tune it to standard pitch, because that is wrong, and you're likely to lose that customer. So a lot of this is the psychology of Lutheran, and it is just as important as the technology. Most beginning guitar builders, uh, I see an awful lot of them think, oh, I'm going to sell direct. And therefore, I can sell direct at what other people are selling for wholesale because there's no middleman in the way. And what happens is that these aspiring guitar makers They've got immediate success. They've got a little coterie of, of their friends and family who buy their guitars. 
And after about a dozen guitars, they have to realize that, oh, oh, I've run out of customers. How do I get them out there? And then you fairly quickly start running into the, well, I need dealers. Well, the dealers for an aspiring luthier with no name are going to want to do consignments. So right away, you're giving up minimum 20, usually 25% earn. They earn their tank. You know, they're, they've, got, they've got the customers walking in the door. Um, they are being paid to talk to the customers. A uh, guitar maker is not. You know, guitar maker gets paid at the bench. Um, a great example of that in the repair business, Frank Ford one year at uh, Griffin, took very careful count of how many hours he spent talking to customers versus at the bench. And at the end of a year, it was a thousand hours of talking and a thousand hours of work. And so that $75 an hour suddenly becomes thirty-seven fifty, And pretty soon you're like the rent, there's insurance, there's utilities. Um, Pretty soon you're, you know, <laughs> you're making new minimum wage. You know, you're making maybe 15 bucks an hour. Over the years, particularly after about 1970, uh, I started running into guys like uh, Michael Gurian, Stu Mossman, uh, Steve Klein, Bob Taylor, and everybody was eager to share techniques. All of us who were sort of alternative, pre into early hippie movement, we were all very interested. We, we knew that we could get better if we shared our information. Because the, the knowledge of guitar making was pretty much